Hi everybody, this is Lainey from Kemp Joy Farms. Today I'm just, I'm in my bedroom and I'm gonna do a little video in here. Everybody's at home, so I'm kind of coming back here where I can talk. I want to go over perennials. That's what I've kind of set myself a goal to study and learn about. And so today I'm gonna just share with you just what I've kind of learned after just a few hours. Sometimes I don't understand why I put off things. Sometimes I, I, I think subconsciously I put things off for different reasons. With perennials, I think it's just silliness. Um, it's a matter of impatience. I remember looking in the Johnny's seed catalog several years ago. Uh, well, I really got into gardening in 2020. So this was probably 2019. I was really studying these catalogs. And I remember seeing asparagus and they just flat out said in the catalog, you won't get this until the second year. You may not get any asparagus uh, until the third year. <laughs> and I just went, no, <laughs> no, I don't want to grow that. I don't want to grow that. I wanted to grow 53 day beans, just bush beans. I didn't even really want to wait on pole beans a whole lot at first. I wanted bush beans. I wanted spinach. I wanted things like that that would grow so quickly and so i set to just ordering seeds that would grow kind of quickly a lot of which are all annuals and that is kind of where my heart was those first few years i didn't really even want to think about asparagus artichokes things like that that take a while i didn't want to really even i'm like you know what you can buy those at the store if you need things I can buy a can of asparagus if I just absolutely crave it. Why worry about growing it? But as with everything right now, times are evolving, things are changing. And as we move, hopefully in the next few months up to our new property, I want to go ahead and, and learn about perennials. I want to go ahead and put these things on my property from the jump start, so that it, they're not an afterthought so that I can build everything else kind of around them. I can have these certain dedicated spots for certain things. And I can also add more later, things change. I'm not gonna uh, say that I'm coming up with a master plan right off the bat or anything, but I do want a few in there. I do want a few things in there. And so last night it was lightning and thunder and at our property when we rode up there, we couldn't even get out of the car came home and we don't live that far from our property about within 20 miles. So if the same weather was kind of here, usually if it's rained here and we drive that way, the rain just goes with us and vice versa. So I couldn't get really anything done outside at either place. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna sit in a chair and I'm gonna just start learning about perennials. And really I probably only sat there and learned for about two hours, but I learned a lot. And then last night before I went to bed, I actually stayed up late almost to midnight, just looking at some things on my phone to kind of, to kind of make some things make sense because it doesn't always make sense. And that's one thing I'm learning. And maybe this video can kind of help you see some things that gave me a little pause and I can maybe explain those things. Um, not so much with the perennials themselves, but with how they're marketed is very confusing to me and some things that I see in my catalogs I didn't even realize were perennials. So I just want to kind of show you what I learned in this, just this short space of time. Am I here to teach you about perennials? Not really. I have uh, an education about this big about perennials, <laughs> really three or four hours. So no, I don't qualify myself as a teacher, but what I'm hoping is that just the things I've learned, and if you hear them and absorb them, um, might help you. And we can just share information. That's the way I'm looking at it. I'm just gonna share with you the little bit that I've learned so far, but it's kind of opened up this world to me in just a few hours that I really wasn't expecting. I really just started my search yesterday to, I, I got on my phone and I just Googled perennial plants that can be grown, perennial vegetable plants and things came up. But what happened was this whole world started kind of opening up to me. And then I, I got out, I have in front of me here, that's why I'm sitting the way I'm sitting. I have on laid out on my bed here, some catalogs that I already owned, but I got them out 
to hunt through them for perennials and it like opened up even my catalogs. These are catalogs I love. These are catalogs that I've went through every page of, but I didn't realize that I was kind of discarding things. I was just, oh, asparagus, don't want that because it's too, too long. I was discarding things in my mind and I was only focusing on a few things. They're tomatoes, they're bush beans, just cucumbers. You know, I was focusing on a limited amount and especially this year with growing to sell to people, I had just a kind of a limited focus. And what I didn't realize was how beautiful some of these catalogs were and how much information they had that I didn't even realize was in there on perennials. So if there's anything that I can kind of convey in my video today that helps you, that's what I'm hoping for. Now, I will tell you, I've got it written down and I do have some notes because I can't remember all this by myself without some notes on some of this, but I Googled uh, perennials, perennial plants that you can grow or whatever. Well, a site came up and said, you know, the 10 most popular perennials you can grow. And here they are, daylilies, alfalfa, dandelion, chickweed, red clover, sheep sorrel, shepherd's purse, yarrow, henbit, and plantain. Well, I can tell you, I looked at that list, <laughs> I wrote them down, and I was not impressed. I'm just not impressed. Yes, every bit of this has its place. Every bit of this does, but I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. The more I learn, the more I grow, the more I expand my mind about perennials. I, I just may be sitting here in a year from now just doing videos, talking about tinctures and salves and whatever. I'm not there yet. I am a babe in the woods when it comes to perennials. And what are perennials anyway? The perennials are just plants that will come back year after year after year. Some of them do have a lifespan. Some of them said five years, 15 years, 20 years. But in general, if you leave them planted, usually leave them where they are. Uh, some perennials don't like to be moved around just every time you get uh, an urge to change your garden. You need to kind of think ahead when you're doing perennials and find a spot for them and just kind of leave them alone. That's why I'm trying to think of this before I move to my property. And then I'll do my regular plants and gardening um, in other spots. But these perennials, um, can kind of form the basis of our property and the basis of my growing and vegetables up there. And also a lot of perennials put off beautiful flowers and some of them grow kind of large. So you can kind of use them as the backdrop to a flower bed, or you can just, you can count on the flowers that are gonna come on them as being beautiful certain times of the year to give your yard color and uh, for the pollinators, it's just a whole new ball game. You're not just waiting on this little bloom that's only gonna bloom a few weeks on one of your annual plants. Some of these perennials will just start in spring and go to fall and they'll only just die off in the winter and then come right back early, early in the next spring. So for a, a pollinator's point of view, perennials are just magnificent to have growing in your garden. Now, people that are great gardeners, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I'm kind of coming at this as um, a kindergartner, just learning, just learning. I'm, I'm just a few hours into this, but I just thought I'd go ahead and convey what I've learned. Maybe it'll help somebody. Maybe uh, it'll interest you a lot. And I would really, really, really want to hear comments. If you're growing any of this that I mentioned in here, please tell me. If you have hints, please tell me. If something is a dud that I've chosen, because I did choose like, 14 things that I was gonna focus on. I've kind of eliminated one, but I'm still gonna talk about it. Um, if you hear me say one of them and you have just had an issue with it or it's just terrible or there's anything I need to know, just tell me. I'd appreciate any kind of comments I can get on this. So from the original list, daylilies, alfalfa, dandelion, chickweed, red clover, sheep sorrel, shepherd's purse, yarrow, henbit, and plantain. I think the only one that made the cut was the sorrel because I do want to grow some greens that have some pungency to them that I can use for different reasons. I, I don't mind growing greens. Dandelions grow like crazy down here in the South. Um, I know there's probably a whole dandelion cult out there, but I kind of wanted some 
perennials to get started on my property that had a little bit of meat to them, that had a little bit of um, vegetableness to them, <laughs> and not necessarily just edible flowers or a, a weed that's got a really good stalk or something. You know, I kind of wanted something with a little bit to it. Let me show you what I've chosen and I just want to hear from you and just see what you think about any of this. So first thing on my list out of the 14, the first thing that I came across in doing my research yesterday was rhubarb. That being said, I think I've eliminated rhubarb. I think I've just eliminated it. Um, the reason, there's kind of two reasons. Okay, rhubarb was just something I knew nothing about. I just knew nothing about it. And that's one of the reasons I think I'm kind of eliminating it. There's people out there now going, oh my God, it's delicious, don't eliminate it, don't eliminate it. But I'll tell you what, where we live, rhubarb is just not something I don't know if I've known anybody that grew rhubarb ever. I don't know if I've seen rhubarb in our grocery stores. It came up on my list and I wrote it down and I was so excited because it was such a highly recommended perennial. But in, in where we live down here, just we don't eat it that much. And I, I'm really worried that if I, if I focus on it, because it is a two year vegetable, you don't get to, to eat the stalks until the second year. I feel like if I spend a lot of time and focus on it, um, it just may not be something I'm real big into. It is technically a fruit, which I didn't really know that. And this is a thing that's gonna confuse people and it confused me in my studying yesterday. So I'm telling you this in the event that you've been confused about it. Rhubarb looks just like Swiss chard. They look alike. a lot. That really only the differences are in the shape of the leaf and the veinings and this, that, and the other. They look so much alike. And what confuses it even more, and I don't know who names this stuff, but they shouldn't have done this. There's a variety of Swiss chard named rhubarb red. And if you look at it, it looks like rhubarb. So they named some Swiss chard rhubarb red that looks like rhubarb, but it's not rhubarb. Swiss chard is a vegetable and you can harvest it and eat it just like collard greens or mustard greens and cook the stem and the leaves and everything. Getting to my reason number two that I've eliminated rhubarb is rhubarb is considered more of a fruit. It's a sweet, sweet, sweet stalk that you eat, that you chop up and use in your jellies and your casseroles. However, the leaves on it which down in the South, we would want to chop those leaves and julienne them up and, and stew them down like collard greens. The leaves on them are poisonous. One website said they may be poisonous. Well, when do you know that? When you eat it? <laughs> I'm not sure. Other websites say they are poisonous. So I'm just gonna err on the side of rhubarb leaves are not to be eaten. Okay, I have young grandchildren, one years old, three years old, so I don't want anything in my yard knowingly. There's things I'm sure, I, because we're, we live by some trees and I'm sure there's things out there they shouldn't eat, but I don't want to knowingly grow something that's gonna maybe put them in danger. So I'm eliminating it for me, but it is a good perennial. And if that's not a concern of yours, if you don't have little children that are gonna be around your garden, um, it's probably delicious. And I know they make so many pies and things that just, uh, tarts and things that look just so good out of rhubarb. And I wouldn't mind trying it, but I think that might come later on. Uh, it's just not gonna happen right now. The second uh, one I wrote down was the sorrel. I didn't call it sheep sorrel on my list. I just called it sorrel because there's different varieties of sorrel. And it's one of the earliest greens that will come up in the spring. So that's good. It'll die back during the winter, but it pops out very, very early in the spring. So you'll have it. And it uh, has just so many nutrients in it. Sorrel is just one of those, those greens that is just like a superfood. It's kind of packed. And it's got a, a little bit of pungent taste, but that's okay. I kind of like things like that. I, I really do. The third thing I put on my list are chives.
the chives are in the allium family, the same family the onions are in and all. Um, these chives are kind of like the bunching onions, which are also on my list. So I'll just throw all that in right now, I guess. The chives can multiply at, in the ground. They can spread their root system, uh, divides and spreads, and you can just, you can harvest and then you can let them keep going. You can cut and they'll grow again, but you can also divide and spread them and they'll, they'll just keep going. So chives are one of those things that if you kind of pick out a little spot in your uh, yard, maybe just in a, a, a real soil nutrient kind of part of your yard, um, and then you could just let them be. Now, I've never, I've planted seeds for chives before and they didn't come up for me and they didn't grow, but it's just a big difference of where I'm at now and it's so much full sun and so much heat and the, the place that we're moving to has some shade. I have some shady spots I have a different kind of soil up there. We'll see if it's better or worse, but it's it's different up there. It's it's a darker soil. It's not um, so so akin to the sandy reddish soil that I have here. Um, so we'll see. But I'd love to grow some chives. And while I'm talking about the bunch of onions too, in that same family. Bunching onions were one of the things that confused me. Um, they're like, they're green onions, a lot of bunching onions. Some of them may not even form a bulb at the bottom. They just may be straight down to their little roots, but they'll multiply the same way as these chives. They kind of grow and they, you can divide them later and spread them out, or you can harvest what you need and take them out or whatever, but they'll just keep growing, growing, growing. I, a friend of mine, a lady from church, used to have a bathtub, a ceramic bathtub out in her backyard. And that's where she grew all her green onions year round. She would divide them and spread them and you know, they, she always had green onions. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to do too. Just have that bed of green onions that will always be there kind of when I need it. But this is what confused me is most of my catalogs had bunching onions in them but nobody really talked about the fact that they were perennials. They would just always say in 60 days, whatever harvest you can harvest or plant, he plant here and harvest here. But those onions can stay in the ground. You know, if you want to make them into a perennial, from what I gather, and I did some, that's what I stayed up late last night studying was I was so confused as to why they didn't call them perennials in a lot of my catalogs. And one catalog in particular, separated them out from the walking onion, the Egyptian onion slash walking onion that they specifically said was a perennial. And then they had bunching onions on this side of the page that they didn't say were perennials. So I thought, well, are bunching onions perennials or not? You know, I, I was confused because in some of my research, bunching onions would come up on perennial list all the time, but they can be, they're different though. A walking onion, has a little bit of a, a bulbiness underground with the root system, but the stalk comes up and then it makes like a flower that is full of bulbs up there. And you can either harvest those little bulbs and eat them as well, but what they'll do is that, that stalk will eventually kind of fall over and those onions will get on the ground and grow new onions. So they're a self-perpetuating plant. And they that's why they say they walk because when the stalk falls over, it's not by the base of the stalk anymore, it's over here and new plants will grow and then it falls over and new plants will grow. So that's why they call them walking onions because they will spread. The next one that I picked out, so we've gone over rhubarb, sorrel, chives, and we talked about the bunch of onions and the walking onions. The next thing I picked was asparagus. <laughs> I'm gonna try it, I'm gonna jump in. <laughs> Once you plant asparagus, they're pretty much there to stay. And I'm saying this from someone that's never planted it, so just tell me if that's wrong. But I think pretty much you have to kind of pick out where you wanna put it because it's there to stay after that. It multiplies kind of under the ground, it spreads and pops up here, there, and yonder. So once you plant it there, you need to leave it there. Some companies will sell you the, the bare root little starts and some companies sell seeds. So I'm gonna go over that in just a minute too, because it's very interesting what you can find out about all that. 
Asparagus loves the sun and well-drained soil. Got plenty of that. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I can get this going. I would love to have an asparagus bed close to my house and for all time, you know, as long as it wants to grow. Some people have been growing asparagus in the same bed for over 20 something years. So I'm hoping mine does that. The next one I put on my list is Jerusalem artichokes. I've also heard from some of the other homesteaders channels and things that uh, those really, really walk and spread too. So uh, you have to kind of keep a handle on them. I think wherever you put them, you need to be prepared that they're gonna walk and spread. But what I liked about them is they're very drought tolerant and we can get a lot of rain like we're getting right now that this, this cycle we've been in this last week and a half or so, but we can also go through a whole month of no rain. And some of my plants this spring just fried, just died with that heat and no rain. And even when I watered them, they just, it was just too much for them. So I would feel better for food security reasons if I could get some things planted that are drought tolerant. And Jerusalem artichokes seems to be one of those things that I do want to try. I saw little warnings about don't overeat this because it can mess your stomach up but I would like to kind of have it just as an add-on and something with a little bit of a heft to it. It's not just a plant or a green, it's got a little bit of heft to it. Also the globe artichokes. Now they were mentioned as perennials on the, some of the websites that I saw. There again, in a lot of my catalogs, it never mentioned that they were perennials. So that gets kind of confusing and I need to do some more research on it. I do know that a lot of times it's that second year you might um, get something, which technically can be like a biennial, if after you get something that second year, the plant just that has completed its cycle and dies off. That's called a biennial. Perennials will have more than just that first and second year. But I do believe because I live in a warmer climate, and these artichokes won't be exposed to just horrible snow and cold. I do believe that I might could keep them going. I do believe they're the kind of plant uh, that has a long growing season. And I do believe it's the kind of plant I might could keep going down here. I'd be curious to know from anybody that grows artichokes, any kind of comments you have on that. Are they true perennials or do they want to die off after that second year like a biennial? I'd be curious to know that because um, I don't want to invest tons and tons of time thinking it's a perennial if it's hard to make it a perennial and it just doesn't seem to want to be a perennial and you, you end up, it's gone after the second year. I would just be curious before getting into it. I still would like to grow it because supposedly they're just beautiful and uh, the part that we eat is actually the flower part and you can let it go to flower and it's just a gorgeous uh, thing to have in your garden. So I'd be curious um, to know what everybody else thinks about it. If you've grown artichokes, please let me know. The next thing I wrote down was horseradish. I don't sit around craving horseradish all the time. We do eat a lot of uh, cocktail sauces and things in South Louisiana that contain horseradish and I like it. I don't know that it's something I would need a lot of, but if I'm talking about perennials, it is a perennial, it is a root crop, and I, I think I would like to try it, maybe just one or two plants, just to make sure that I at least get one that makes it, and just try it and have it around. And then if I had fresh horseradish, I, I could develop some ways to cook it and use it that, that I think our family might would like. All I've ever really had is just the little bitty jars. Uh, in Louisiana, we have Zatarain's horseradish. <laughs> And all I've ever done is just use things out of those little jars. I've never had the fresh root to work with. And if I'm gonna truly get into perennials, I think I would like to try to at least get me um, one good plant going of horseradish. Number eight, I put down watercress. And it's another peppery kind of tasting um, lettuce. It's in, it's in the specialty green section of most of your catalogs. But it's supposed to be uh, not real easy to grow. It's supposed to be not real easy to grow, which 
you think, well, why would you want to do that? I don't know. I just wanted to kind of uh, grow some types of greens that were perennials. Sorrel seemed to be a good option to me. Watercress seemed to be a good option to me. I think with watercress, it's not real easy to grow because it needs a lot of water. And so you need to make sure that it's not one of those plants you ignore during a dry drought time. I think you need to kind of keep it happy. Oh, and I also made notes here that it's not real easy to grow and it attracts pests. So why did I put it on my list? Well, I don't know, but here's the third thing that might uh, have shown me what convinced me to put it on my list. It's very, very rich in vitamins A and C, niacin, thiamine, and iron. So in times of shortages, in times of shortages, there needs to be some items, whether you've sat around and just thought, oh, I just, I crave watercress. <laughs> whether you've thought that or not, you might wanna have it out there because if you can harvest it and serve it up to your family, especially in a time of shortage, and it is rich and rich in vitamins, I, I think you need some of that outside. So I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna see there are some places on our property, not right by my house, but some places that are very close that tend to, to stay moist. And I'm thinking I might try to see if I could lay in some watercress there and just see how it grows. I've got to do a little more research on how to put it in in a good way to give it the best chance that it can get. So I've got to do a lot of research about a lot of these things, but I'm just getting started and it's very exciting. The next one is garlic. And a lot of people already grow garlic. I tried to grow garlic this year and I planted the little, uh, the little garlic toes. And what I got was bigger garlic toes. <laughs> I didn't get any bulbs at all. I just got bigger garlic toes. Uh, big, beautiful, beautiful stalks. And the stalks were like that big around. They were gorgeous. And I just thought I was gonna harvest these big bulbs of garlic and it didn't happen. But I also, I probably didn't pay them any attention. I mean, I, I didn't uh, fertilize them with anything special. I think they do sometimes need that little boost of fertilizing at certain points, and I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I got busy doing all my row gardens, and I ignored my garlic, and um, I just got bigger toes. <laughs> so, but that's one thing that I do want to have growing perpetually, if I can, is some garlic. And because if you can harvest those bulbs, then you ha always have seed because you always have garlic toes on those bulbs that you can take even just one bulb and plant your next series of garlic. You can always have garlic. And, and I wanna grow things that are just self-perpetuating and garlic is one of those. Now, the next thing I put on my list and a lot of people already grow is kale. And you might be thinking, well, kale's not a perennial, but actually, I, that's one thing I learned doing this study and in just the short time that I did, is kale, there are kale that are annuals per se, but a lot of kale is very hardy. And sometimes you almost can't get rid of it. And I had that experience this year with some red Russian jack kale. Well, actually I planted it last fall. It stayed the whole winter. It was there in the spring. I tried to pull it up and plant other stuff. Well, it came back. In another flower bed, I pulled it up to plant beans. It came back right up the middle of my beans. And it's just, it didn't want to go away. And if you walk out there right now, I have little bitty sprigs of it because I have pulled the second part up to try to get rid of it and little sprigs came back. <laughs> and so here we're going into the fall. If, if I hadn't have done all that pulling up, I guarantee you that kale would still have been there because it looked perfectly fine and healthy in the summer when I was pulling it up. And if it would have rolled right into this fall, it would have done great in the cool weather. And so some kale is just kind of hard to get rid of. And so it can I can see where it can be a perennial. However, I did find out in my research that there's at least two types of kale. There's probably more, but there's at least two types of kale that are true perennials. And one of those is the sea kale, which kind of grows very good around coastal areas, warmer areas. And the other one was called cosmic kale. 
And I'll tell you in just a moment where I found that you can get those um, seeds from. I actually think that you actually get um, some bare root seed stock from them. So I'll share that in just a moment. The next thing that I picked out was something called Good King Henry. Now this is called a poor man's asparagus, but I don't really think it makes like an asparagus uh, stem. What I saw on the internet was mostly just greenery and it does send up some flowers when it starts bolting and all, but it was mostly just greenery but it'll grow in partial shade. It likes partial shade. It will grow in full sun if you have a milder climate, but I think for me, it's going in shade because we it gets so hot here. And you need to kind of eat this in, in a moderation too, because it is high in a certain type of acid that can kind of make your stomach hurt. So you, do, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to make it the salad, but it can be a few greens of it in addition to, to kind of bulk up your salad and give your salad greens a little mixed taste. So, and it's just a, looked like a pretty plant. It looked like a pretty plant. It's something I think I can grow in the shade. And I would be curious to know if anybody that's listening to this has ever grown Good King Henry and what did you think? Um, I'm just kind of going by the research I did, which sometimes the internet can make everything look beautiful. <laughs> So if you know more about it than you can share with me, I would appreciate it. But it's an old heirloom uh, perennial and I would just, I'd love to just see if I could grow it. The last two, same thing. They're kind of older perennials, but I wanna see if I can grow them. One of them is called Lovage. And it's from like the middle ages. It's, it's an herb but it has the taste of celery or even a stronger taste than celery. And that interests me because we do eat a lot of celery here in Louisiana. It's, it's always in our gumbos, it's in our etouffees. We eat a lot of celery. If I could grow something like Lovage that to me is easier to grow, it looks easier to grow than celery, then, and have that same flavor and, and you can um, do the little bunches of it, turn it upside down and dry it. And it gets about six to seven feet tall in, in like a bush. So I think it would be just something beautiful to have growing in certain parts of my yard. And I, I wanna try it. And it's one of those things that I ended up finding in Johnny's seed catalog that I didn't even know was in there. I never saw it in that seed catalog. So I, I'm just amazed at what all I missed when all I was really looking for was annuals and simple things you know, in these catalogs. I just missed so much. The last one was interesting and it's called RAMPS, R-A-M-P-S. And it's also in the Allium family, kind of like a, a green onion. Uh, these are purple on the top and they're kind of like a little bulbing at the bottom and they actually just grow in forests. They grow on forest beds and forest floors. Uh, it's not something that's easy to grow from seed. A lot of times you just wanna get uh, a ramp stock and plant that and let it grow. And it, it warns you in here that it might not do anything that first year, but the second year, it should come up and do fine. They don't like to be messed with once they start growing. So pretty much where you put them, leave them alone. But I think if, just the way I'm thinking about it, it looks like an item that could really be something you could really add to salads. Uh, it's all edible, the stem and, and the leaves and everything, even the flowers that come on it are edible. But it also looks like something I could chop up that little bulby part at the end and use kind of like an onion, use it in different things and uh, in roux and saute it and make things with it. So I want to try it. And I do have some little wooded, darker parts of the yard that I think I might would try to grow this in and I think it would make it. Now, is this the end all do all list of perennials that you can grow? No, there's so many more. There's a, a lot of your berry plants. I wrote a little list down here, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, and then grapes and cherries, your apples, your pears, your apricots, your plums, your mulberries, and then some of the nuts, hazelnuts, almonds, walnuts, more. There's even more that I'm not listing on here. 
those are all considered perennials. They come back year after year. Maybe they might skip a year sometimes. Some of these nut or fruit trees, they might not have a great year. Maybe it all depends maybe on how the winter was or whatever. But if they stay alive, if you keep them going, you might have just a bumper harvest the next year. So there's so many things. There's so many things to pick from. So I encourage everybody, if you can, do your own research on perennials. Maybe just introduce one perennial this year, maybe one next year, and just go forth like that until you kind of have, uh, I hate to just use the term food forest. To me, I get tired <laughs> if I even start thinking about having to plant a food forest. It just exhausts me because I don't have that much time to, um, I don't know, just even to visualize it all right now. Even visualizing and planning years and years ahead to this perfect food forest can just wear me out at this stage I'm at in my life. However, I'm just going to take it one step at a time. I might end up with that same food forest at some point, but it's going to start a little at the time as I can do it with what I've got. And that this little list, I think, is gonna get me started. I'm gonna try to order what I can from these companies and um, just see what I can get going. I may not get it all going right now because you still always have other work to do. You have so much to do in your life. You have food to cook, clothes to get going, things to think of, bills to pay, and you can't just always be immersed in gardening. But it gives me something to hope for. It gives me something to shoot for. It gives me um, just the hope that my, my yard can turn into this beautiful place at some point if I do a little research, spend a little time, and put some thought into it. So it gets me excited, and it gives me something to think about, to look forward to, and I'm all about that, and I hope you can do that too. I want to just tell you real quick, I had the Johnny's Seed Catalog. These are the companies that I pulled to use from for this little uh, project that I set upon myself. The Johnny Seed Catalog. I also use the Holmes Seed Catalog. They're out of Ohio. Just got this catalog for the first time last year. Now I grabbed my 2021 Fedco Seed Catalog. They're out of Maine, but I think I have a 2022 one, but what I needed, the information I needed was in that one anyway. This is the Seed Savers Exchange out of Decorah, Iowa. And they had something interesting in there that I wasn't expecting that I completely missed when I looked through their catalog before. Johnny's is out of Maine as well. Okay, I use the Territorial Seed Company catalog. And they're out of Oregon. Here's the Harris Seed Company catalog I used. They're out of Rochester, New York. And then of course, this is Baker Creek's Whole Seed Catalog. This is the 2022 one from last year. So I encourage you to, um, any of these seed companies that I, I've shown, I have more catalogs. I just, I picked these because I thought they might give me a good breakdown and maybe have all of this in it and they did. Okay, let's start with Johnny's. Johnny's had rhubarb in their catalog. They had sorrel, chives, asparagus. They had horseradish. They sell the bare root, uh, root stock for horseradish, not seeds. They had watercress, garlic, kale. Let's see. They had lovage. And that was what surprised me. I didn't know that Johnny's had lovage in it. And they also had some bunch of onions. In the Holmes seed catalog, Holmes had rhubarb seed. Johnny's had the seed and crowns. Holmes just carried the seed. They also had chives. For asparagus, they had seed and crowns. They had kale. They had bunch and onions. So Holmes had a good many items. Fedco, I just love the Fedco catalog. Uh, they just have some unusual things in there. But they had the sorrel, the chives, the watercress, they had the sea kale, which is the true perennial kale. They had bunch of onions. 
They had the good King Henry in it. I was so surprised about that, but they had the good King Henry. I think that was the only place that had the good King Henry. Yeah, yeah, Fedco was the only place that had it. And they also were the only place that had the ramps. So I'm gonna definitely be ordering from Fedco here shortly. Seed Savers, Seed Savers Exchange, they had chives, they had kale, and they also had the lovage. Now, Territorial Seed, they uh, just surprised me. I didn't realize what all they had in perennials, but they had rhubarb and they had the rootstock. They had sorrel, they have chives, and they had asparagus. They offered seeds and crowns. They also had Jerusalem artichokes, which not everybody did. They had the bare root horseradish, they had watercress, they had garlic bulbs, and in the kale, they offered the sea kale and the cosmic kale. In the bunching onions, they offered the walking onions and the other types of bunching onions, seeds or bulbs. And that was all they had, but that was, uh, that was a lot. Okay, the Harris Seed Company, they offered the bare root rhubarb, they offered sorrel, chives, the bare root asparagus plants, the horseradish was also the bare root. They offered garlic, kale, bunch of onion seeds. That was Harris Company. And Baker Creek, they had chives, they had asparagus seeds, they had watercress, they had kale, they had bunch of onions, and I didn't, I had wrote an X on Lovage because I did not find it in their catalog. But last night when I just in general Googled Lovage just to see who all sold it, rareseeds.com came up, which is Baker Creek. So I may have missed it in their catalog or it's just something they have on their internet that wasn't in their catalog, I'm not sure. But Baker Creek did show that they had Lovage. So that was good. Now, if you look in some of these catalogs, if you have them, because a lot of them are well-known catalogs, you may have them too. Sometimes, and this is what kind of stumped me, is sometimes it wasn't easy to find these perennials in there because they, if they had a, a really detailed index, they might have written every little thing they carried in the index and then you could just go to that page. But some of them had like a section called root vegetables. Well, that was where you would find Jerusalem artichokes and horseradish. So if you didn't know that, you would have just looked in the index and thought it wasn't in their catalog. But what I did last night was I just kind of flipped through every page of these catalogs to make sure whether they had something or not. That being said, I did not also follow up with Google searches. I happened to have done it with Lovage, and that's how I caught that on Baker Creek, but there may be other items on here that if someone from these companies was listening, they might go, oh, well, we have this and that. She didn't mention it. I did my best, but I did my best pretty much looking at their printed catalogs, and I didn't go online and Google every one of these items for every company. So I just want to let you know, you might can find it on the websites of your favorite company if you search there, even though it may not be in their printed catalog. So this has kind of been a long video, but I felt like it was a lot of information. And I hope you can feel that I'm excited about this. I'm excited to learn something new. I'm excited to learn there's a whole new world out there just besides uh, quick producing green beans and tomatoes. I love tomatoes. I love all that stuff. But for long term, to make a, a, a home place that has items that I don't know. I'm, I'm visualizing my grandkids just seeing Momma grow in certain things that are just always in the yard. You know, times are busy. Uh, kids are going to grow up. They're going to start playing sports and doing things. And there may be many times where we see them a lot, but we might see them at their house or we might see them at their ball games or doing their things. They might not be up at Momma's. So they can miss uh, a life cycle of a green bean. <laughs> you know, I can plant a green bean and they could miss the growing cycle of that because we're just all busy and they, they may not be at my house during the right time for that. They might eat it later and I can tell them I grew it, but they might miss that. But perennials are the kind of things that can always be kind of sitting in your yard wherever you place them. 
those Jerusalem artichokes. They can go around the side of a building or something and, and, and say, my mama always had Jerusalem artichokes growing back here. My mama always had this growing here. Uh, the whole time I was growing up, my mama had this, you know, growing here. And to me, I think that's what has excited me about doing this is it can be things that maybe I'll grow that nobody else has growing and it can be perpetual food for our family, but it can also just be a story. If, if I can get lovage going or if I can get ramps going, I can guarantee you nobody else has those and I'll be able to, to offer those to people or cook something in it and say, you know, I cooked this with some ramps I grew <laughs> and they're not going to know what I'm talking about, but it's something new and it's something uh, original and delicious and and we'll just see. We'll see how it goes. I'm looking forward to it. It's just given me a lot of hope, a lot of excitement. I think you have to just kind of re-energize yourself sometimes with gardening. You have to give yourself a new angle of looking at things or a new way to do a bed or a new way to plant something or just different flowers, whatever it takes to keep you excited about gardening. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you like it and share it. And I hope you just maybe decide to pick out a perennial or two and get them going in your yards. There's a whole world of flowers that are perennials as well. So that's a whole different ball game. But today we just focused on a few herbs and mostly vegetables. And um, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to get started on it soon. This is Laney at Camp Joy Farms. Thank you so much. And I hope y'all have a great day. Bye-bye.